Um, hi, Jason. Thanks for helping my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name is Jason Cranford Teague. I am the director of experience design uh, for, for Capgemini. Uh, I've been doing uh, digital design for 30 plus years. Um, and I've been into space exploration even longer than that since I was a very young child. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I design all sorts of uh, digital online products uh, for a variety of clients. Um, you know, over the years I've, I've worked, I worked on WebMD when it launched. I've, Worked at AOL for a while in the uh, uh, kids and teens website back then when AOL was actually a thing, um, and um, and I uh, worked at Marriott and um, Capital One and all over the place. But you know, um, my my own interest in space exploration and you know getting back to the moon, you know, probably started when I was a baby. Uh, I was born, you know, just shortly before the the moon landing, and uh, I I cannot say that I remember the first moon landing. I, I don't even know if I'd turned one by that point yet, but I do remember in the early '70s watching the, the the subsequent moon landings. I remember as a very small child being very excited to get to watch, you know, the the latest moon landing or you know space flight or whatever, and uh, it's just been a lifelong love ever since then. Uh, that's uh, really amazing. I was wondering, uh, so I mean, back in your AOL, AOL days, I imagine that was mm -hmm. the last part of the 1990s, uh, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. No, I was there during the decline in the 2000s. We were trying okay. to say we were we were desperately trying to uh, to bail out the sinking ship and uh, didn't get didn't do it. I, so, do you remember what actually got you interested in space? I mean, uh, I'm sure you were interested in a lot of things. Why, why does space make the cut? Well, I mean, it, it probably sounds a little bit stereotypical, but it would have to have been Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek, and, and to a lesser extent, Space 1999, if you remember Space 1999. Whoops. Oh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to change the, the blinds. Um, you know, back in the early 70s, that was it for science fiction. Um, uh, you know, and I, and I remember my, my, I had an older uh, brother and sister, and they'd watch Star Trek in the 60s when they were very young. But when it came out in syndication, every night we watched Star Trek. And I just remember just loving that idea of the future. I think I grew up thinking that was going to be our future and that we were going to have a nice, happy little uh, federation and and humanity would have grown to the point where we're not constantly trying to uh, one up each other. Um, you know, you bring up Star Trek and I keep thinking about what a, a, a central role Star Trek uh, mm -hmm. played in terms of creating a common vision and a common vocabulary and kind of a common something to work towards. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd like to get your take on uh, what your thoughts are about that. And now it seems like we don't really have anything that's equivalent to that. I, I, I take your meaning there perfectly. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, if you read about, um, about, um, uh, about, I'm sorry, it's 8.15, it's early in the morning for me still. So um, the creator of Star Trek. Um, oh, Gene Roddenberry. Yeah, Gene Roddenberry, I'm sorry. No trouble. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, um, you know, he really, what, what he was trying to do is what we think he was trying to do it's, it's always disconcerting because I, I like for instance there are science fiction authors i've read who i was like oh this is so great it's meaningful it's such a great and then i read their political views and i'm like well i obviously got the exact wrong thing from what you wrote um but with gene roddenberry it was all sincere it was all there now sometimes you know like with the first star trek movie he got a little bit uh a little bit too uh, ahead of the game in terms of trying to present science fiction as more than just, uh, you know, phasers and photon torpedoes. But um, to your point about nothing new, I, I would have definitely agreed with you until I watched Star Trek Discovery. 
and I am a huge Star Trek Discovery fan now. Uh, I discovered it during the the quarant uh, during the quarantine when when I was locked down and I started watching it. And to me, Star Trek Discovery has that same sense of hope and purpose and a positive future, even when there's great adversity. You know, not all the storylines are, are great in it, but overall, I, I like the fact that they've really stuck to the idea that you can do a show about good, decent, kind people and make it interesting. And that's what I think that show is. Uh, so I would say that Star Trek Discovery, my humble opinion, is the best successor to the original series in terms of that overall sense of positivity about the future. Um, I think, you know, there was a lot of that in Next Generation, um, but it got darker and darker, and especially with like Deep Space Nine getting darker and darker. And I love those shows, but they they oftentimes allowed that kind of moral complexity to interfere with a clear storytelling of, you know, a positiveness. So, um, so if you haven't watched Discovery, highly recommended show. Um, I'm looking forward to watching the new uh, Boldly Go series as well. I really liked it's a spinoff from Discovery and uh, I, 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 it really looks cool. I'm just waiting for a few more episodes to drop before I, I binge watch it. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of positivity around that. I, I once a few years ago, um, I started having this idea though that, and I, I started writing an article, I, I don't think I ever finished it, called uh, Science Fiction Destroyed the Future. Mm -hmm. And it was basically my thing. And I actually ended up having a debate uh, at, uh, at a convention. I was in a debate where that was the, the motion was that science fiction destroyed the future. And my basic idea was that, especially in the 80s, when everything came, became so dystopian, it was almost like we, we kind of gave up on that hopeful future. We gave up. Now, I'm a huge cyberpunk fan, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I, I felt like, you know, through the predictions of science fiction, oftentimes I think people became kind of disaffected with what the future could bring. And I think that's that's unfortunate. I think that's very unfortunate. And I'm trying to look for more, not not utopian science fiction to read these days, but at least something that's not just like, OK, I want to go out and slip my wrists if this is going to be my future. Yeah. But I, I agree. Um, I mean, I need to check out Discovery. It sounds really great. I think I would personally enjoy it. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of places that a lot of things are produced that may have kind of a hopeful future uh, telling. But one thing that I think Star Trek, you know, the, the series that was created in the, the 1900s. By Gene Roddenberry. By Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> <laughs> had that it would be very difficult for anything to have today is that uh, penetration of the market, you know, yeah. the, yes. the ubiquitous yeah. awareness of it. Yeah. Um, Again, I watched Star Trek in the 70s when, uh, when I was growing up, I, I don't know how old you are, things began to change rapidly in the 80s, but in the 70s, if you had more than three channels on your dial and it was a literal dial, you were lucky. You were, you were probably living in New York, you know, or LA, <laughs> but where I was, you know, you had the three NBC, ABC, CBS, and then sometime in the seventies, you know, a, K, a, a, a independent station came on UHF or VHF, whichever it was, but that's where you could find Star Trek. And it was because Star Trek was on every night. And again, in the 1970s, that and space 1999 were about it when it came to real good science fiction. Uh, and so, yeah, that message really penetrated and caught on. It did. And I mean, you can even talk to people who had no interest in it and they would mm -hmm. be able to conjure up pictures of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to imagine a similar type of thing that you could go up to a wide group of people and get answers from today. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it's that, it's that strategy because that's, that's another thing I do a, a, a lot of thinking about partially it's part of my job, but also because I just like thinking about these things is that stratification of communication has really kind of broken down any central cultural themes. And it's kind of, you know, everybody has their own thing now, it seems like, which is great in a way, but at the same time, can work against unity. Right. And 
it, it turns everything into uh, a net zero sum game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like either they get it or we get it. You know, so yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, talking about that stratification and communication, uh, I like to ask you a question that I ask people at coffee shops and um, you know on the at the airport coffee. while I'm on the train and, and stuff like that. And uh, did you know that NASA is planning to send astronauts uh, back to the moon? Oh yes, I did. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I, I keep getting confused as to exactly when I was. I, I read something yesterday. I said launching in twenty four, landing in twenty five. I was like, okay, so I've got my dates. Because every time I turned around, I was like, oh, they're getting the rocket to the pad. I'm like, wait, are are we launching that quickly? And and I have to read and go, oh no, they're just it's a prep. It's a prep. It's a prep. And um, and I think uh, I, I, honestly, I understand why they do it. They want to keep people aware. But at the same time, I, I worry that they're kind of, you know, if I'm a little bit confused and burned out by by all the coverage, I'm worried that maybe the general public, it's just, you know, when it finally does launch, they're going to, oh, it did launch this time, you know. So I do worry about that with their PR and communications. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, uh, would you would you believe that, I mean, what percentage of people that I randomly go up to and ask that question to, do you think uh, actually know about? I would say it is higher than zero, <laughs> but I wouldn't go much beyond that. <laughs> it, so I haven't actually been keeping track, but my rough estimate is about 20%. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds about right. And, and, and of those who know about it, that's maybe all they know, right? Yes, we're going back to the moon. <laughs> Right, and also, I mean, you also have sampling bias. Um, the people who are more interested in space are more likely to talk to me. You know, going yeah, that's uh, true. Going up to a random person saying, "Hey, can you talk to me about going back to the moon and your the future yeah. of humanity and stuff?" Uh, yeah, you know that that's that's not exactly always a a sure shot way to start a a conversation. Yeah, well, it's probably more useful than a Twitter poll, but <laughs> that's true. Um, but do you remember how you found out? Oh, I just follow a lot of different uh, space news sources. I mean, I, I get something every day uh, in my uh, in my uh, in my news feed about about it. And I, I'm usually scanning news headlines. You know, there's only so many hours in a day. So unfortunately, like most people, I get a lot of my news just from the headlines, which not always the best way to get it. But um, I would say that. But you know, I'm I'm definitely a unique case. I I'm a designer who came up wanting to be the next Carl Sagan. Uh, that was my dream in life as a teenager. I didn't want to be an astronaut. I wanted to be Carl Sagan. Um, but after you know two and a half years as a physics major in college, I I came to the conclusion that there were just some things that calculus and I would never see eye to eye about. And um, so I, I went into English literature and design, and here I am now um, designing. But you know, I've always maintained that interest in science. I read New Scientist magazine. I've you know got a whole feed set up for just science news on my iPhone. Um, but getting people interested outside of that—that's a real challenge because if they don't have that bug, if they don't have that. I we've got to we've got to travel off this planet but for no other reason. Uh, it's really cool and exciting to do. Um, then why would they care? I mean, it 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 it's, it's a really interesting line in uh, Sherlock Holmes where uh, you do you know the one where Watson is talking about I think it was the Earth going around the sun or something like that, and Holmes like didn't know. And Ross is like, how could you not know that? He's like, why do I need to know? How is it going to help me solve a case? How is it going to, how is it going to, how does it affect my day? And for most people, it doesn't affect their day. And, and with the recent, you know, troubles, let's call them, that we've been having between economic and, and disease, I think a lot of people, it's just not something they see as a critical um, task for humanity to perform. Whereas, you know, the rest of us are out here going, you know, that meteor strikes, Mars is going to look awful today <laughs> in a few years. Um, and that, you know, part of our hum humanity and our human intelligence is being aware. I mean, I, I read a really interesting uh, uh, 
article kind of philosophical that the whole point of intelligence is to preserve intelligence it's it's there because it, it is a survival mechanism beyond running away from the lion beyond you know getting out of the path of the volcano um you know this is at a global level now where we're intelligent enough to know that there is this existential threat called an asteroid or or, or a comet or god forbid a tiny black hole that could you know almost instantly destroy this planet so we need to figure out how not to be there here when it happens you know and that is really hard to explain to people who are like yeah but gas is five dollars a gallon yeah that's true and you know a lot of people believe the end of the world is uh an inevitable thing mm -hmm. and uh something to look forward to actually yeah yeah th those are the people who scare me a lot <laughs> i grew up around a lot of those people <laughs> it's uh yeah it's it's difficult and I just worry some of them might think that uh, not only is it inevitable, but maybe they need to help make it happen. <laughs> help it along, yeah. Help yeah. it along. <laughs> give it a little, give it a little nudge. Yeah, those are the people who scare me the most. Who who look at our future not as one of hope and growth, but one of destruction, uh, for the hope of something better afterwards. I, I'm like, I, I, I want to make sure everything's working here. Uh, you know, whatever happens afterwards happens afterwards. I can't be, I can't be concerned with that right now. We gotta, we gotta work on the work on the reality we have now, not hope for a better one after, you know, after we're dead. Exactly. And, you know, it's, um, Who's to say that that's better? It's just. You know, oh yeah. Of, well, I always tell people, you know, if Jerry Falwell's version of heaven is correct, that's actually my hell. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's true. Um, I guess, I mean, if we all, and is it important that people know we're going back to the moon at all? I mean, is it like? Does it matter? Or I mean. That's, no, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think it, uh, an answer to a question like that, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. In a way, if the money's there and it's getting spent and it's consistent and we go and we set up a base and we accomplish all of that, do we need the public support to do that if the government is, is, is taking care of that? On the other hand, if you don't get the, the public support, if you don't capture the public imagination with this, then it's probably very, um, it is very likely to fail because eventually people are gonna say, gas is $5 a gallon, stop spending a billion dollars on a rocket to go to the moon and get my, my gas prices lower. Um, so I, I think that one thing that, maybe we don't i don't want to say we don't do a good job doing because i think we do a good job it's just such a difficult job is communicating why it's so vital and why it's so important you know i i i have plenty of friends um uh, you know who who they go to that canard why why should we let's take care of the problems here first and it's again it's hard to to, to show them that it's you know space is about more than tang um you know that all that our modern world really would be very different technologically had we not gone to the moon had we not had the moon race with russia um but it's hard to see those effects because they were there and so it's hard to say okay had we not done that you wouldn't have your iphone or you know you'd still be using zippers not velcro or you know stuff like and 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 small things that add up so how do you get people to see that actually going into outer space can help us solve climate change can help us produce new and better fuels can you know that that's what that technology oftentimes results in on our planet and then you've got the people who say, well, I wish we didn't have iPhones and I, I think we, technology is taking it over. And so you have that contingent too, who they, they, they don't want to go into space because they, they want things to stay pretty static the way things are here now. Um, well, I mean, that brings up another question. Do we explore to innovate or do we innovate to explore? Yeah, 
I, I well, not to be difficult, but I, I think it's it's part and parcel. It's part and parcel. I I don't think. F- let me give you an example. For me, uh, I've written I've, I've written about eighteen books on digital design. So I, I'm glad people buy books. I tend not to. How I learn something new, like if I need to learn a new uh, piece of software, I find a project to use it in. And then I use it in that project and I learn how to use that pro- by using it. And I think innovation and um, I'm sorry, the other word innovation and um, exploration and exploration, they have to go hand in hand. If you're not, if you're exploring, you have to innovate. If you innovate, you've got to have some place to go. You have to have some place to use that. You can't just innovate and go, OK, I've got this cool thing. Um, you know, it has to have a purpose. It has to have a use. Um, you know, so many things seemed impossible until we found a good use for them. You know, back in the 70s, no one thought everybody would be having their own little computer one day. You know, and nobody even really thinks about their phone being a computer that is more powerful than the Apollo by probably a factor of 10, by the the Apollo, you know, moon lander by a factor of 10. But that's you know, that's, that's what emerges from it. Um, and, you know, I guess it depends on if you like the world you live in or you don't. Well, uh, I have a theory about the Apollo program and spinoffs. I went mm-hmm. to run by you. Uh, I think one of the biggest dividends we got from the Apollo program was actually the technical engineering workforce that suddenly become ultra cheap whenever it got shut down. Yeah, and that yeah. that was probably the biggest source of innovation. Yeah, uh, across the economy that we got. I, I I agree. It's that talent that got trained to do this that went on to do other things. Yeah, but I, I was actually I was at uh, Kennedy Space Center. This was back in the early two thousands, and we were in the Apollo room. Or, you know, it's it's a big. Um, you know, it's a big hangar type thing. And they have the several, I think they have a full width Apollo rocket in there, or at least sections of it. And we were sitting at like a little uh, little snack bar there. And the guy sitting next to us, it was an older gentleman. And we just started chatting with him. And he had been one of the safety engineers on Apollo 13. And he was, he said, I was the guy who closed the latch on Apollo mm-hmm. 13. And I was like, wow. He's like, yeah, sometimes I just wish I'd checked one more time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, those people, but again, he was already, this is early 2000s, he was quite old. And there wasn't the sense that there was a second, a, another generation really coming up behind him, at least not with that kind of in-depth uh, knowledge. It, it felt a lot, it feels a lot more fragmented these days. I mean, also, I mean, you talk about in-depth knowledge. Um, I mean, during the Apollo program, we had to understand things deeply and yeah. uh, invent new stuff. The space program that we've had since then has largely been about reusing stuff we already know about, staying with inside of our envelope of experience. I just wonder if you thought that actually uh, even allowed for a similar type of innovation. I, 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 yeah, actually, it does. Um, because innovation isn't always based on coming up with something completely new. It's about, uh, oftentimes, it is about taking existing pieces and using them in new and, and better ways. And I think I, I understand, I think I take your point about, you know, why don't we have a better rocket than basically, you know, Apollo 2? Or, or Saturn, or Saturn, Saturn six, <laughs> um, and and I think w- with technologies, you have that period where it's new, and with the space program, we had to make it new and get it working and get hit the goal as quickly as possible. But now that that technology is better understood, it's been refined. Um, I think that is oftentimes a better way to go rather than ditching what worked, refining it and making it better. Now, you know, liquid fuel for for rockets is is heavy and expensive. Solid fuel, 
you know, um, also, but, and, and there are all these, you know, uh, you know, I read every day about different, um, about different uh, potential energy sources um, that are coming up. And I think, you know, we'll get there. I think one of the big drivers is, is right now is what is the actual system you use to propel the craft. And as far as I know, there's not a better system that's reliable than what we have, you know, with with uh, with the current space program. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas out there, but none of them have been tested that you would want to you would want to risk your life going to the moon on. Hmm. So I think innovation will come, but don't let innovation become only about the new. Sometimes it's about refining what you've already done. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, so what are your thoughts about us going back to the moon? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, went, I, I literally, my wall was, uh, was a moonscape. I had a huge uh, mural. My mom bought it for me. It was basically wallpaper, but it was a full wall moonscape with the earth on the horizon. And so, you know, I always like, oh, one day I'm going to the moon, one day I'm going to the moon. But the older I got, the more I, you know, I studied them. I'm like, well, the moon is like that rocky island just off the coast. Yeah, you can get there, but maybe have a picnic, but you're not going to want to live there for very long. Um, and so, you know, but I, uh, you know, I've read both sides of the story. The moon is necessary for getting to Mars and off the planet we can bypass the moon. We really don't need to go there. It's just a, it's just that, you know, deserted island off the coast. Um, you know, I, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a space professional. I don't have a PhD in, in science. Uh, although I do have a master's in science. Um, but um, but I, I think if for no other reason, as a short-term goal, getting to the moon will hopefully revive that sense of, of the public, uh, a public sense of exploration, uh, you know, that need to explore. That would be my hope. And I think if we waited and we bypassed the moon, it would be several more years before we could even th really think about getting to Mars. Although obviously there are a few uh, car manufacturers out there who are already planning highways. Um, but, you know, people lose interest really quickly. And I'm hoping that once we get to the moon, you know, I'm hoping NASA will do something every year that really gets people to pay attention. Um, because, you know, in a way, eventually space travel will become like a trip to, uh, to, to Europe, you know, it will become something that, oh yeah, I got to go to Mars today. Um, mm -hmm. That might be centuries away before that, that happens, but eventually it won't be anything out of the ordinary, it won't be anything extraordinary. It's just getting getting to that state, that point. I think is going to be a hard slog for for humanity, unfortunately. I it's just kind of interesting if you look at like the previous 150 years and how far much we've developed then, versus maybe even the previous thousand years before that. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, it seems like things have really. Like, I mean, who could have predicted that the past 150 years would be like what they were? Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely nobody in the 19th century, you know. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think anybody really was writing about a future that was so connected. And I think that's one of the big changes. Uh, you know, everything, yeah, there's all these technical advances. But if you if you think about what has happened to our culture and our society, it's always driven by how quickly we can communicate with each other. Hmm. And, you know, the telegraph <clears throat> made it possible to send a message a great distance. And, and I, I, we oftentimes, I don't think we really realize that's huge. For all of humanity, you had to send a person with a message. Maybe you could even write it down. That was a huge innovation as well, writing. But then the telephone, and you could talk to the person. And as the internet came along, we are now, I, we literally can talk to any other human on the planet 
instantaneously at any time. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we just live with that. We don't think about that. We don't think, oh yeah, my great, great grandfather was lucky if he met, you know, a hundred people in his lifetime. And I encounter a hundred people, you know, in a Sunday afternoon. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people who think about this and write about this, um, but it's not something I think that the general public really thinks too much about or recognizes is that being in constant contact with each other, I, 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 I tweeted this out the other day, I'm not always sure that's the best evolutionary step that humanity could have taken at this point, um, because I think it, it is leading to a lot of conflict. But then at the same time, it leads to a lot of innovation and advancement. The whole purpose of the web uh, created by Tim Berners-Lee was to share scientific research papers. That's why the web was, was created in the first place. And so I think we've got to kind of keep an eye on our future and how we're going to deal with the fact that we are now in constant contact with other human beings, um, you know, and I, I think that's going to be a big driver in the future that will then affect, you know, space exploration and, and, and all other branches of technology is how we deal with that, how we deal with this constant connection. No, that's true. Um, so, I mean, because my next question is gonna be, uh, you know, obviously this, this um, 150 years of development, I kind of came out of nowhere and whatever caused it, do we still have it? But if it's about the communication, then maybe we still have it. But I, I'm just wondering if there's something beyond communication that's necessary in order to keep the innovation happening. <clears throat> um, a purpose. I mean, really, innovation is about having a purpose. Um, you know, there are happy accidents where you know technology jumps forward because of a happy accident like a you know a piece of mold falling in a petri dish um but most advancement takes place through you know massive effort uh which involves communication you got to be able to communicate with each other um but i do worry sometimes that humanity might be losing a sense of purpose and it may just be at where we are now in history uh, you know, I'm, I'm, there was probably somebody back in, in Rome in 200 P BC going, you know, we're losing our, our, our purpose here in Rome. Um, and so it may just be cyclical. You know, it may be that we have to take some steps back before we can take some steps forward. Because um, are we culturally ready for the technology? In other words, um, just because we can make it, should we? You know, were we, was humanity from a cultural societal standpoint ready for the nuclear bomb, you know, uh, or nuclear power for that matter? Um, and, and I think society has to grow in advance in order for technology to grow in advance as well, uh, because otherwise we create technologies that then get misused to make our lives worse instead of better. Uh, indeed, as you're talking about that, I was thinking about warfare and uh, thinking mm -hmm. about Russia and Ukraine and that whole thing. And that was like thinking, you know, biological weapons are probably, you know, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was thinking, you know, what a strategic idea to try to completely isolate yourself uh, through the Ukraine conflict so you could use biological weapons without them coming back and... <laughs> and, and, and harming you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of. Uh, yeah, a dark scenario. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think the war in Ukraine, Ukraine kind of harkens back to that whole, are we ready yet? Are we ready as a society to to leave? Are we ready as a society to go off planet? Yeah, we're intelligent. Yeah, we understand the problem. But if we can't make it happen, then maybe, you know, I used to debate my dad about world hunger. And he would say, well, no, we have plenty of food to feed everybody. And for a long time, I didn't have a counter argument. And then it occurred to me, yeah, but we're not. And so maybe technically we can produce all the food the world needs, but as a society, that food's not necessarily getting to the people who need it. So, how, you know, how do we change that, you know? 
Yeah, and then you know about the whole um, Mars thing. Uh, you have the um, you know fixing problems in your own community or moving to a community that's that's a better fit for you. You know, it's like yeah. that's a struggle. What, yeah, what well, do you, you do? You look at the history uh, of, of of movement around the globe. If you weren't if you weren't forced to move, if you weren't what's the term involuntarily le relocated, I think that's the new term. Um, then you were leaving because you needed to you, where you were wasn't hospitable for you anymore either economically environmentally uh or or personally you know uh maybe you committed a crime and you need to get you want to get someplace else and that's what you know that's what uh the americas represented you know putting aside the fact that there were already lots of people here um you know it was about my life isn't good here I want to go someplace where I can make my life good. And, you know, we don't, we say, you know, you know, and, and trust me, I don't want to live on Mars, right? <laughs> definitely not right now. Uh, Earth is a beautiful place. You know, it, it is a, it is it, it, literally the only place we know like it in the entire universe. Um, but if that meteor is, is coming towards us, or I, I, I read, uh, um, was it Five Eyes? Have you read that, Neil Stevenson? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, something probably. I, I don't know. I I I I had to stop reading the book halfway through because it it scared me so much. Um, but basically, I, what I think was a, a tiny black hole hits the moon and splits mm -hmm. it into five big chunks, and then mm -hmm. all that debris rains down on Earth, basically, and destroying it. And the last of humanity is in these small little uh, orbital satellites um, revolving around it because they, they didn't have anywhere else to go. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's, you know, I hate to catastrophize, but catastrophes happen. And rarely do catastrophes give you much warning. So you've got to be ready when it strikes. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Well, um, if you kind of pull out your crystal ball and you kind of look at what life might be like in 200 years, um, what do you see? Uh, there are so many different paths. It's really hard. It really depends on our trajectory now as a, as a, you know, as a culture or as a society. Um, and I, I, I worry about our trajectory, especially over the last few years. I think, you know, in 200 years, humanity may not be here, you know, um, for whatever reason. I think there'll still be life on Earth. I, I hope there are humans around to do it, but I, 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 that's like the darkest scenario. Um, I, more hopefully, um, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm working on a story because a few, a few years ago, I was like, I'm sick of dystopias. Why is only why does everybody always write dystopias? Every time I pick up a science fiction in this cyberpunk dystopia, I'm like, all right, I've read that. Um, so I started working on the idea of, okay, how, how would a, if not a, a utopia, a really happy, good human culture, what would it look like? And, you know, I think one of the key issues is, uh, is energy sources. You know, so much of our conflict, I think you could argue all of our conflict comes from uh, the need for resources, especially energy resources. So if we could solve that, if we had unlimited free energy, that would completely revolutionize our society. And I don't even think we could even begin to predict how that could change our society. And, and you know, who might want to try and squash it to keep power. But that's a little conspiracy, <laughs> a little bit too conspiratorial. The other thing is, is longevity. And I've been reading a lot on that. People want to live longer, but a lot of times I think we've confused living with living well. And, um, you know, I don't want to get to 80 or 90 years old and, you know, have poor mental faculties and a body that I can't even, you know, walk across the room in. I, I just don't see a lot of, perp you know, I, I just don't, that's not the life I want. So, you know, I thought of, a, I came up with this idea, what if uh, suddenly, you know, science fiction, uh, deus ex machina, um, 
all of human genetic code was rewritten so that the aging process stopped at 34 and you lived indefinitely in a 34 year old body. And I did some research and 34 is 33 to 36 is like the optimal human body age. And so I started thinking about, so if I had unlimited energy and everybody lived to 34 or everybody stopped aging at 34, what would that world look like? And, and, and uh, you know, a lot of this bit sounds crazy, sounds like science fiction, but, you know, every day I'm reading articles about, you know, there's new drugs saying it's going to stop the aging process. They figured out that this protein here is what causes the, the DNA to unravel as you age um, and, and things like that. And so I think if we can survive, I think those are the things that people are going to really um, uh, benefit most from is, is, you know, not having to worry about where energy comes from and, and the great innovations that will happen when you don't have to worry about getting energy. Um, and then, you know, the, the aging process, people, you know, living more productive lives longer. I think that will be, a, uh, I think that is something we will hopefully see in the future and, and hopefully to good use, not ill, you know, like uh, there's a sci-fi network show, Dark Matter, where, you know, only the elite lives forever, mm. you know, at this young age. And, and that might be the big thing societally we have to figure out is how do we reward people for their work without making it so that, um, I'm not wording this well, how do we close the gap between the haves and have nots? Let me put it as you know succinctly as possible. How do we close that gap? How do we make it so that there aren't people out there going, you know, my life sucks. That rich person over there has a great life. I want their life, you know, and everybody can just kind of live a happy life. Yeah. <clears throat> that's what I hope. <laughs> that's the that's the bright future I want to see as opposed to the dark future where everybody dies. <laughs> but I mean, a, a lot of it comes to uh, personal feelings, right? Uh, some mm -hmm. people really want to be richer than other people. Like it's like their, their identity. And then- Yeah, yeah. Well, I think for them, it is, they, they equate money with power. And, you know, I'm not saying money isn't power, but if you take that power dynamic out of it, then what are they living for? Uh, you know, I, 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 one of the things I say, if I, I would consider it a personal failure, if I was ever a billionaire, that might sound like sour grapes, you know, cause I'm never going to be a billionaire, but you know, if I had that much money, if I'd accumulated that much wealth and I wasn't just like, you know, with a, with a shovel, just shoveling it out to people who need it. I, I, I don't know that I could live with myself. Sort of like, um, um, Mackenzie Scott, uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, ex-wife. Yeah. Oh, which one? <laughs> uh, how many ex-wives? Which, which ex <laughs> well, well, he has nine kids born. now because apparently he had twins last November. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I think he read a lot of Heinlein as a child. I think he really, he wants to be more like a Heinlein character than any anything else. <laughs> oh, Bezos? Yeah. No, no I'm, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of. Um, Musk? Musk. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of Musk, not Bezos. I'm sorry. I, you know, billionaires, dime a dozen, right? <laughs> <laughs> we need uh, billionaire trading cards to oh, keep God. it all, all, yeah. all sorted. Yeah. Um, They'd have to be digital, though, so that the, the amount they ha their, their worth could, could be uh, 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 Wi-Fi updated. <laughs> that, that would be uh, curious. I think at some point we'll have paper like that. That's, yeah, you know. actually, we do really. Um, I mean, it's actually really been around for a while. That whole um, liquid ink. Mm -hmm. um, I've been seeing on Twitter. Uh, I, I I don't watch commercial television anymore, so I cannot speak to any ad on television right now. I haven't seen a television ad in years, but I get a lot of Twitter ads, and on there one, there somebody was selling a tablet that was using that liquid paper, and it's very thin. And it, it looks like paper. They even textured it so it feels like you're writing on paper. Uh, and so that's, that's really interesting. I don't 
think it's going to be a big success because it couldn't really replace an iPad. And so why would I get another device just because it has a cool UI, you know? Yeah. I would, it, but most people would. <laughs> is it the uh, Remarkable? Yes, I think that was it. Yeah. Okay. I think that was it. Yeah. I mean, I was like, yeah, that's really cool. I wish an iPad did that. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, part of the thing about the Remarkable is that it's not an iPad. Like, you can't get distracted. Uh, you can't yeah. go and start yeah. watching yeah, YouTube right videos sure. and you're, you're not going to get messages that pop Every up. Every few can... years, I wipe my devices mm -hmm. just to do a complete factory refresh. And then I only install apps as I use them. <laughs> And it's amazing how few apps I'll have for a while. And then just over time, oh, let me try this one out. Let me try, oh, I need to watch something on this one. And then, then the next thing you know, it's like, you know, I can't find the app I need because I've got so many apps on there. And it, it does make it difficult. But um, uh, would you take a trip to space? Oh, hell yeah. Um, how far would you go? Uh, I think it would depend on a number of factors, uh, my age being one. Um, I, I would go as far as I could go, go out and check out Voyager and see how it's doing out in the far reaches of the, it's past the work crowd now, I think, right? Uh, yes. I follow I, it on Twitter, so I should know these things, but yeah. <laughs> um, so let's say you took a trip to um, low Earth orbit. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what are some things that you'd want to do there? Well, with low Earth orbit, other than the fact, hey, I'm out in outer space, um, you know, it, it's really just about monkeying around in 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 in. in, in I'm going to say zero gravity. I always, uh, you know, I always think it's funny that it is not technically zero gravity. There's still gravity. Uh, it just feels like zero gravity. Um, but monkeying around in, in in that, I mean, it would really be more about having fun. I'm not a, a scientist. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm an. Uh, oh, I was about to say I am an artist, but I'll take that back. I am someone who does drawings. So you know, I'd probably draw and sketch and write and 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 be inspired up there, you know. But you know, beyond that, it's not like um, you know, if it's a trip, it's not like you're you're building a, a a world there. Now, if I moved to low Earth orbit, that would be that would be a different scenario, you know. How would it be different? Well, obviously, um, let's say I could, I could, I could live in low Earth orbit because I can work from anywhere uh, right now. Um, you know, adjusting to that environment obviously is going to take a lot of time. Um, I don't know that I would want to move to low Earth orbit. I'd love to visit, but I, from a practical standpoint, unless you're going there for the express purpose of needing zero gravity, of needing those particular environments, there's not a good reason right now to move to low Earth orbit or to the moon or even to Mars, um, unless it's just out of a sense of exploration. And right now, not everybody can really, you know, if, 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 if I were a European in, you know, the 17th century and I was thinking, they have great farmland in America. I'm going to go move and I'm going to be, be a farmer over there. Can't really take my skill set and move to space and do something that's going to keep me alive. Let's put it that way. So, you know, until, until the explorers get there and build the habitats and build the places for people to, to actually exist and live their normal lives, you know, I, I, I definitely wouldn't want to move there. When that happens, definitely trips if possible. And if, not cost prohibitive, um, but you know, even eventually, depending on how old I was, if Mars was relatively safe, sure, I wouldn't mind spending my last few years there. Maybe that's it. We need retirement colonies on Mars. <laughs> Send all the old people there. Like, <laughs> uh, most people stop at thirty-four, but those who make it to thirty-five, they're on their way oh. to Mars. Oh wow! You just gave me an idea for a science fiction book. <laughs> can't wait to read it <laughs> a revolution of uh, geriatrics on the mars uh over living conditions in their retirement home wow <laughs> <laughs> um okay so let's assume that we have the mars colony 
And uh, either you or one of your descendants actually immigrates to Mars, and it's 200 years in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's your great, 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 not sure how many greats it is, granddaughters in high school mm -hmm. in a history class on Mars, lived on Mars mm -hmm. her entire life. Her parents have lived on Mars her entire life. And she's writing a paper on Earth in the 2020s. Mm -hmm. um, how would you help her make sense of this decade? From 2020, the 2020s, it's hard to help somebody make sense of what you're, you're going through. Um, I would hope that in that future, we have resolved a lot of the very critical issues that we're going through in this decade. And that she sees 2020 as a, a turning point in humanity. That 2020 was the decade, um, even if we didn't sort all the problems out, we really were like, okay, these are the problems we have to address. And that, that the 2020s was that turning point, hopefully not too late for some of the issues. And I hope they, that, that, that descendant of mine, he, she, they, um, um, write about, you know, you know, things were looking bleak. <laughs> there was a big worldwide plague that killed millions of people. Uh, there was a, a, a world war. I mean, nobody's really saying it out loud, only a few people, but I, I actually have a, a worry that we are actually in World War III right now. Um, and, um, and, but the, the 2020s was, that, was that, that turning point that um, what was in Star Trek, uh, Zephyrin, Zephyrin Cockrum, the inventor of the warp drive mm -hmm. where, you know, and they meet the Vulcans and first contact and all that, that, that I don't know if there will be a single event that they'll point to and go, that's when things began to change. But I hope the 2020s is a period where we begin to turn things around uh, towards progress and away from regression. Sounds Sounds awesome. Uh, well, uh, Jason, that's pretty much all the, the questions I had prepared. Mm -hmm. um, were there some things that you wanted to talk about uh, would you that mind we if didn't I, get to? Would you mind if I plug my book? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, I, 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 I wrote it. Um, I've, I've been a member, uh, I've been a participating in uh, Yuri's Night, which is a celebration of Yuri Gagarin on April 12th every year uh, uh, on the anniversary of his flight, his first space flight. Um, and uh, so I, I worked with that organization for a long while, helping them set up parties around the world to celebrate. Um, and a few years ago, uh, I was, I was teaching a class and I, I had to take the train between DC and Philadelphia. And I was on my way back, it was April 12th and I was missing all the parties. And it dawned on me, I was like, has anybody ever written a children's book in English about Yuri Gagarin? And I went on Amazon, nothing. There was not mm -hmm. a, there were plenty of, you know, biographies and even a few, um, you know, uh, you know, teenage level books, but there was not a, like a storybook about Yuri Gagarin. So I thought, I could do that. And so that night on the train, I started writing a children's book about Yuri Gagarin's first flight. And I, I knew a lot about it, but I did more research and I got some exact quotes and stuff like that. And so um, I mentioned it the next in my next class, the next week in my class, and I had a student who's a big space fan. And he's like, Would, do you need an illustrator? And I was like, I thought about doing it myself, but you know, I'd rather have somebody else. I'd rather have a partner. And so he illustrated it. And we came up with this book, it's called Yuri Was Very Brave. And it takes Yuri from the launch pad uh, into orbit and then back down to the ground. And it's written that, you know, it, you could read it to a child of really any age who wants a book read to them. But, you know, from a reader level, it's about six to eight year olds could, could easily read this book. And so, you know, um, it's, it's a labor of love for me. I, 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 I did not publish this with the idea of becoming a billionaire from, from publishing a children's book. Um, but I just like sharing that type of hope for exploration. Uh, it's, it's very apolitical. I, I don't, I, I mentioned Russia in the back when I, I have a paragraph about, you know, for the parents. 
Uh, but you know, there's no flags or anything like that. And actually, I got some I got some feedback from some Russians who were very upset that I did not <laughs> make it more clear that this was a endeavor of the glorious uh, Soviet uh, Soviet uh, sphere. Um, but you know, I I just I am excited. I, I just think it's a great story to tell to inspire people to want to go and, and explore space. So, um, you know, you can uh, you can find it at yurybrave.com. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and everywhere you can order it from them. Haven't sold a tremendous amount of copies, but as I say, it's for me, it's more just about, you know, sharing the message than it is about making a few bucks. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's just about uh, getting people familiar with it and they recommend it to other people and, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, in 200 years, I hope kids are reading my book. <laughs> uh, they might be speaking uh, kind of a different language on Mars. Oh, though. that's true. That's that's very true. It might be uh, English 200 years from now. That would be, that's, I don't know, probably a lot of words that represent emojis. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it might be all emojis. <laughs> The entire language might be, it'd be yeah. hieroglyphics like yeah. Egyptian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you so much, Jason. I um, really liked your book. I was actually reading it this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, good. I'm I, glad you got the link. I'm glad you got the link. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier this year, I was just giving away digital copies of it. It doesn't cost me anything. And, you know, so why not? So, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to me for a digital copy, <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than happy to send you the link. That's awesome. Well, Jason, thank you again so much for speaking with me and for participating in my project. And Oh, um, glad to, glad to. And uh, yeah, let me go ahead and just uh, stop the recording. Okay. Yeah, I did a, a 